Moving on to the NFC South post draft grades. Has our stance changed on the shocking pick draft day? Number eight overall Falcons going with quarterback Michael Penix and more from the NFC South right now. NFL analyst Brian Peacock and former NFL scout Matt Williamson bring you expert NFL analysis every day in less than 30 minutes. Get an inside look at the NFL on the field and in the front office with elite breakdowns to next level analysis and in-depth information only for the real NFL fans. This is Peacock and Williamson, and it starts now. Welcome to the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. Brian Peacock alongside Matt Williamson at BD Peacock at Williamson NFL. Thanks, everybody, for making us your first listen on the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. We love our everydayers, and we love it when you subscribe. Please hit that subscribe button on YouTube or anywhere you are listening to this podcast. Today's episode of Peacock and Williamson is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 with any winning $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. I don't want to spend too much time on the Atlanta Falcons pick of Michael Penix. We've gone through this draft a lot. We panned it originally. Not many folks liked it or understood it right away. Matt, have you had a chance to think about it more? And did the selection of Michael Penix Jr., quarterback out of Washington to Atlanta, pick number eight overall, does the the process, does the pick, does any of it make a little bit more sense? Do you like it more now? after uh, you know a couple weeks than you did originally when the pick was announced on draft day i don't think so to be honest with you i mean and that's not even a a knock on the player and i i said this at the time i think i said this friday after the day one went in the books that hey i understand never passing on what you think can be a franchise player and if he is great i just think you're not going to know that for a while it's just going to be an asset that's sitting in the basement you know for a while and I, I just did this real quick too two things I said to you before we hit record like man this division isn't real super exciting for draft stuff like it was hard to come up with headlines other than panics and I didn't think any team took a massive stride forward to being the dominant team in the division but I thought Atlanta could have if they make a different move here and then I double and I looked at one other thing just now too, and it shouldn't matter. I mean, it really doesn't. But everyone understands Cousins' contract and situation. But Taylor Heineke's in the middle of a two-year, fourteen million dollar deal too. You know, like how many assets are you going to have in your quarterback room for your second and third stringers? You know, an early pick, uh, fourteen million dollar contract over two years for Heineke plus Cousins when you could have you know. Penix and Brissett or Locke, if you love them that much before free agency and Christian Wilkins or something like, you know, it's good at other things. Other things is, is where this comes down to for me. Yeah. And on one hand, I understand it's the most important position on the field of course. Yes. and maybe in sports. And if you think you have a super stark, if you think it's the next Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady, whatever it is, name a, a superstar quarterback, Hall of Fame quarterback, you have to take it if you think that's what it is. Mm -hmm. You have to, and I make it, and I get it, I understand it. Um, you know, whatever team you root for, if that player's there, it's too valuable. You take that player if that's what it is that you're getting. The problem is, like, is that what Michael Penix is? And so the evaluation of Penix for me and for most people is, ah, period, at number eight, even if he didn't have another quarterback, I, I don't know if he's that guy anyway. Uh, and so really it, it's going to come down to, is Michael Penix a superstar quarterback, forces his way into the lineup, and you spent too much money on Kirk Cousins in the short term, and you have to figure out what to do with him in a, in a year or two. That's the best case scenario for this. And it's not the most amazing scenario, you know, right, uh, right. Unless, unless Penix is a superstar quarterback and it, it'll be worth it in the end. You didn't get any of the bonus. You didn't get it. It wasn't like he fell to you at in the twenties. So it's not a Aaron Rodgers, Jordan Love situation. You could have. You didn't trade down, and then he's still there, and you still love him. So then you draft him because you have no choice. You didn't give yourself any outs or any ability to make your football team better. 
and he has to be a superstar. This is one of the worst picks we've seen in a long time. So that, that's why I hate it. Um, yeah. You're a new regime, and if you if you were just if it was just because man, we hadn't finished the evaluation yet. We you know we we signed Cousins, and then you know we, we had a that was a front office move, but then the coaches weren't hired yet, and then the coaches were in, and then finally when we finished the evaluations on the draft and got this all together, we really like Michael Penix. Then it's like, well, what are you doing? making these franchise altering moves when you don't even know what the plan is yet. Right. Right. It doesn't look like a, a, the plan, a strong plan was ever in place from the top down, you know? Right. So and there's also, a, there's also a human element to it. You know, like you mentioned the green Bay situation far, basically a hall of famer when they, I'm sure he was when they drafted Rogers, Rogers is a hall of famer when they drafted love and they were in the building, you know, like cousins is just starting to meet people and, He's new to the operation. He's not an incumbent. You know, he still has to kind of make his bones as well and win his teammates over. And now he's got this lumen. Like, I don't think it's just great from a locker room perspective. No. Yeah. I, I, does it, does it, does it, who does it make better? Does it make your team better now? For sure. Not. Does it make your team better in the future? Maybe if Penix is really great, Maybe. does it make your current team? Group. three years from now though yeah on defense better no does it make Kirk cousins better does it make him he's already very motivated i don't, I don't think that's going to be a thing so uh look and i'm not going to give out any f's but he, this is a d draft for me and, and we're going to go through and, and we'll talk about why but he's you know sleeping on it multiple times i still don't get the Penix move uh i don't get the entire off season what is your plan it it, it screams that it's a front office with, without a plan and that worries me for the atlanta falcons and you look at this division that was one of the worst divisions of football. And you didn't find a lot of teams that got better in this division either with the draft. It's like, no. why, why are these teams where they are? Well, it's because of some, some weird stuff going on in the draft. Um, so moving on from the Michael Penix pick, it's going to be hard to talk me into this one again. Like he has to be superstar quarterback and you can't pass on those players. Is that what the evaluation told the league? Well, most teams didn't think so. And uh, most evaluators didn't think so, except for the Atlanta Falcons. So we'll see. Um, Ruka Roro, I didn't love him at the top of round two either. Uh, moving to get moving up to get Ruka Roro, defensive tackle out of Clemson. I get there's a, a lot of ability there, by the way. With Ruka Roro, he's sort of a raw developmental prospect, right? Michael Penix Jr. isn't even like a young, well, oh man, he's gonna be ready in a couple years anyway. He's already 24 right. years old, right? So he's like, uh, he was the play now quarterback anyway. Um, Braylon Trice. You know, third round, fine. Uh, his tape was kind of underwhelming for me, doubling up on Washington prospects there. Brandon Dorless was maybe my favorite pick here, even though he's now uh, kind of, you know, I, I don't know where the fit is for him on defense, but clearly they knew they needed help on defense, so they tripled up on or quadrupled up on defensive players with four straight picks after the quarterback selection. Uh, Brandon Dorless can get after the quarterback a little bit, undersized interior rusher, maybe could play some big end for you. Might be more of a rotational guy, but you know, day three pick round four is okay. If he is just a rotational guy and not a starter necessarily. Um, JD Bertrand linebacker out of Notre Dame in round five, couple of round six picks, uh, three round six picks actually to finish it up. Jason McClellan, Alabama running back, Casey Washington, wide receiver from Illinois and Georgia defensive tackle Zion Logwood were the, uh, the last three selections in this class, Matt. And uh, to be honest with you, I don't know how many of these guys are going to impact the team this year. Maybe zero. How many starters did they get? Maybe they got their future quarterback of the future, which, you know, the, they'll feel a lot better about in a couple of years. If, if Penix turns into that, obviously, and, and we'll see what happens with Ruka Roro and Braylon Trice. If those are, you know, starting caliber, players and difference making players uh, i have my doubts there uh don't like this class at all if i did give out f's i might give them one of those two yeah this is a d for me i mean even if, you know ignoring the panic situation none of these other picks do i love i liked i like rook i don't love trading up to 35 for rook i mean you also had to give something up in addition to your pick a better for, defensive tackle on the board newton Johnny who newton. actually yeah that, but it, no, he is worth he, noting he has Jones surgery today, though, too. I mean, yeah, so yeah, maybe yeah. there's more with Newton going on following right. than we realized at the time. And but he's a better Washington football player than Aurora. Right. He's better now, and I think he's got better future, as long as his feet are okay. And mm -hmm. uh, Washington general manager Adam Peters said that they had a first-round grade on Newton, and, you know, clearly it's the foot thing that, that kept him out, and that's why he fell a little bit. And so, you know, maybe some some teams were a little bit worried about that. Um Washington seems to be less worried about it. So we'll see what happens with his foot stuff. But that's why Newton fell and why Aurora or someone like that could go ahead of him. 
Um, that doesn't make me like Aurora more, though. And right, right. I, I don't know where the impact here is. And I'm looking at this team and this defense, and you still got Grady Jarrett, um, Ebiketti. I mean, they just kind of added more of the same, like, okay, competition exactly. for a mediocre group already. They needed impact. They needed guys that are like, okay, this guy is a cornerstone player for our defense. And uh, they did not find that player, in my opinion. I mean, instead of adding three rookie defensive linemen, I would have loved to have seen Christian Wilkins or Byron Murphy, Brian Murphy, or Byron Murphy, or somebody like that. That's an impact guy, you know. Instead of the quarterback situation, and these probably weren't even wouldn't even have been the defensive linemen I took on day two either, you know. Right. So, I mean, some of these drafts we criticize the first round pick, and we're pretty well through the series now. But then, we're like, man, I really loved their fifth round pick. Well, I don't have that with this draft. I don't, and I do have that with some of these other drafts in the South yeah. to them. So, and that's why it's a D for me. Not only I, I, I didn't value the players they took, where they took them, and I hated the strategy. So there's nothing mm-hmm. I like about the Atlanta Falcons draft. Agreed. Agreed. I don't like the plan. I don't like the players. I don't like the value. It doesn't mean we're other right. than that's great. It doesn't mean we're right. Uh, time will tell. Penix is a superstar quarterback. None of it. He may be a Pro Bowler in three years, and then then the draft's fine. But what could have been this year? You could add your pick of defensive player, and I uh, probably would have done that. Next, we've got the Carolina Panthers. Speaking of teams that we've uh, been scratching our heads about what the heck they're doing for a while now, uh, does this draft help them get on the right track? New Orleans Saints adding a couple of nice picks at the top and uh, the Buccaneers taking the first center in this class. We'll get to all of those classes next. Today's episode of Peacock and Williamson is sponsored by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. It's the formula for winning championships. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car into the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Here we go. We are on to the Carolina Panthers draft, and everyone knew they were looking at wide receivers. They did not disappoint. They did take a wide receiver. They even moved up one spot from the first pick in the second round to the first or the last pick in the first round and selected South Carolina wide receiver Xavier Leggett. They followed that up with a running back out of Texas, Jonathan Brooks, Trevin Wallace, linebacker from Kentucky in round three, round four, tight end Jatavian Sanders out of Texas, Shaw Smith Wade, a cornerback out of Washington State in round five, round six, Jaden Crumedy the Mississippi State defensive tackle, and then finished up the draft in round seven with Michigan linebacker Michael Barrett. What are your thoughts on this class for the Carolina Panthers? Anything move the needle for you? Is this team (laughs) headed in the right direction in Carolina? Maybe I just have like the Monday sleepies, can't get motivated, but (laughs) I think it's the class is not me. I'm not super psyched about this one either. Obviously, the Bills didn't think there was a big discrepancy between Leggett and Coleman and maybe some of the others. Uh, it's fine if the if the Panthers disagreed and had to have this guy, but I really hope you don't trade up one spot just to get the fifth year option because very few of them are being used at this point, and that's not good business in my opinion for a team that needs everything. The player's fine; I, I don't have an issue with it, but he's not a lot different than Coleman or McConkey or Pearsall or the guys that were in that neighborhood for me. I actually like the Brooks pick most, probably, even though they traded up for a running back, which is a huge no-no, because he is a very quarter young quarterback-friendly player as a receiver, as a pass blocker. We don't know when he's going to see the field, but I get the impression the medicals are pretty good. They traded up for a running back coming off a torn ACL. So. Yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, hard to put your stamp approval on. Yeah, that's, that's a difficult one for me. You bring up the wide receiver thing, too. And to be honest with you, Leggett is the player I didn't think fit great for them mm-hmm. because he's so one-dimensional. And uh, they need less one-dimensions on offense. And so they have this group of all one-dimensional guys. And I, he's different than the other guys, so I get that part of it. But did you really need to move up? And, you know, it didn't cost too much to move up one spot there. But did you really need to move up to 
to make it was was he that different and really there was only one team that was clearly not going to draft him anyway ahead of you so i you know fifth year option yeah. is that worth it i don't know i I don't, I don't know if so. Carolina Panthers are doing that. My my favorite right. pick is Trevin Wallace, the third round linebacker, because I think yeah, maybe. A, a, probably a, a clean starting player. I think there and getting that in the third round is nice value. And you know, in the end, they might have gotten four starting players, which is why I like this draft a lot more than what the Atlanta Falcons did, especially where they were selecting without a first round pick. Xavier really gets probably going to be a starting X wide receiver for them at least. Jonathan Brooks starting running back if he's healthy. Trevin Wallace starting linebacker and then Jatavian Sanders, I think is, you know, a nice value in the fourth round, a player that can make some plays in the passing game for your young quarterback as well. Shaw Smith Wade, you know, nickel corner as well, and not a terrible value. So um, it's a C grade for me. I, I don't love it. There's nothing that jumps out to me. I, I, I didn't really care for their first two selections, but they, at least they got players that could contribute and potentially even got four starters and, and five plus contributors, uh, you know, in a rotational role out of this class, which, you know, by itself is good value, but on this roster, they needed something else. I agree. And uh, for just looking at these names, I mean, they didn't have a ton of resources for being the worst team in the league, of course. And I do think the off season as a whole rightfully was about making Bryce Young's life easier. Um, Sanders has a pretty decent path to playing time at tight end, even if it's just situational nitpicking I would have drafted a center you know like the, in a really center rich draft they didn't even add any o line help I was, I was a little shocked by that Jackson Powers Johnson was there for him if they were yeah. Uh, yeah, and so they're and, and even talking like Bordellini like, in the fourth round or whatever I mean like somebody they, they could have dra- they could have drafted two of the guys that Steelers took right in round two right right they right were, they selected in front of the Steelers they could have gotten um Frazier, Frazier there they right. got McCormick in the fourth round they could have done a number of those things uh, on the interior of their offensive line as well. I, I don't really know what they're doing from a team building standpoint here. Um, I don't hate this draft. I, they, their roster needs more. They obviously didn't have a first round pick, so it's hard to have mm-hmm. a huge grade, uh, you know, even after trading up one spot to have a, a late first round pick. Depends they're a hard team to trust in general. I don't love their process with pretty much anything they've done in the last 10 years or certainly since the new owner took over. Yeah. They're, they're, they're in a rough spot. If they were a team that was drafting 32 because they were the Super Bowl champions and they added these players, be like, all right, you know, added some pieces to your roster Uh, for the Carolina Panthers doesn't move the needle a lot. Still not a good football team, but at least they're, they're moving forward. You know, small, they're, they're they're in baby steps mode is, is what this draft was about. Yeah. C minus for me. Next, we've got the new Orleans saints, and this is going to clearly be my favorite draft of Four not amazing drafts, I think, Um, but this is my favorite one. And at pick 14, one of my favorite players to watch in this class was Talise Fuaga out of Oregon State, offensive tackle. I don't know if right tackle is the long-term need, how they're going to, you know, put together that that offensive line. But, you know, tackle was the big need there. And they took the guy that, you know, consensus was the top tackle available at that point at number 14 in Talise Fuaga. Came back with phenomenal value, starting corner all day, smart player. I love Kool-Aid McKinstry. At the top of round two out of Alabama, Spencer Rattler, quarterback from uh, South Carolina, after having no more selections on day two, uh, round five pick, Spencer Rattler, Bub Means, Pittsburgh wide receiver, fast, big, round five, another round five pick, Jalen Ford, Texas linebacker, Christian Boyd, defensive tackle from Northern Iowa in round six, and then finishing up with round seven, Josiah Zerum. He is an Eastern Kentucky defensive tackle. So back-to-back defensive tackles to end this class for the New Orleans Saints, Matt. Definitely my favorite one so far and probably my favorite in the division. I'm just going to call it a B-plus all in all. I mean, they don't have a third and fourth round pick, which makes things tough, of course. I love Fawaga. I really do. I mean, I studied him a lot for the Steelers, um, but he I thought he was a plug-and-play right tackle. I don't love him going to the left. I know that those lines are blurrier than they used to be. I think that's their plan. I also worry he might be a guard, but a really good one when said and done. But good football player, help you run the ball. McKinstry's also a good football player. They have some good young corners now. Like I think Lattimore could be had in trade and open up some much-needed cap space, but they're kind of in win-now mode. So they got a bunch of corners now after this pick. I think Rattler's worth the, the dart throw. Um, Means is a guy I saw a fair amount. Downfield player with size and speed. Good, uh, good, uh, you know, post season or pre-draft process for him too. I think Ford will help. 
And Boyd is like my favorite day three D lineman in this in the whole draft. I like Christian Boyd a lot. I'll give my grade on the New Orleans Saints next. We'll talk Tampa Bay Buccaneers as well. Which which team helped themselves the most in a in a bad South division that's still very much up for grabs for multiple teams in 2024 next. Today's episode of Peacock and Williamson is brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. It's winner take all time in the NBA and NHL playoffs, and FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and a whole lot more, not just NBA and NHL playoffs. we got Major League Baseball every day, all summer long. And, of course, those NFL futures. If uh, you want to bet on the NFL, you still can. Tons of ways to bet. Rookies of the year, offensive and defensive. Players of the year, coaches. Uh, who is going to win the next Super Bowl? You can find win totals are out uh, on uh, on FanDuel Sportsbook. You can find it all at FanDuel.com. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. I do like the Christian Boyd pick. Matt, mm-hmm. you're right. I mean, Northern Iowa, defensive tackle, you know, add yourself some some size there, 317 pounds. And, and when you're in the sixth round range, if you can get somebody, even if they're a, a two-down player, that's value. So, And obviously, they, they needed some competition there. So uh, I like what they did there. Uh, in round six, Bub means you know the n- workout numbers are kind of better than the player I saw on tape. Spencer Rattler, yeah. I mean, we're talking about a fifth round pick. I don't know what to think about him. He's still got a great arm. Um, is he starting at some point for them? I, I you know, just this is this is one of the good quarter. <laughs> Going back a little bit to the, it's funny because we there's a lot of quarterback selections in this draft, Matt. We're like, yeah, I don't know about that. But in the mm-hmm. past, we've, are we talking about out the both sides of our mouth? Because in the past, we've talked about, man, teams aren't putting enough into the most important position. Well, we're talking about Spencer Rattler in round five, taking those types of flyers on quarterbacks, not t- t- spending the eighth pick or the 12th pick on a quarterback that we think is going to be, you know, like, especially we talk about the Broncos. And you're like, okay, you're going to go out there and beat Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert now because you drafted Bo Nix. You know what I right, mean? Right. What, what are we doing here? Um, but Spencer Rattler, he has tons of talent. And round five, if you get a backup quarterback, fine. If you get a guy who could potentially be a starting quarterback, I think that's sort of the thing we're talking about when we're talking about teams putting more resources into the quarterback position. I think he's getting a cheap player who could uh, provide value for you in a backup and potentially be a lot more role rather than spending – a top 10 pick on a guy after you're spending hundreds of million dollars on a guy. So that's why there's such a big difference in a uh, Spencer Rattler draft pick that I like where he was taken versus the Michael Penix selection. Yeah. And the other thing about Rattler too, is I, I always look at the saints through the lens of their credit cards are maxed out. You know, they, they are the most cash trap team in the league going forward and I know Jameis Winston's not the greatest player in the world, but I don't know if this team can afford to have a, you know, a high-priced backup, a couple million dollar backup like a Winston. So you drafted Hayner last year, Rattler this year. If even one of those turns into a solid two on a rookie deal, that saves you some money. And maybe, speaking of money, you got to take your medicine maybe next offseason. They're they're going cheap at quarterback. And yeah. Maybe to Derek right. Carr. And uh, anyway, uh, it was like a B- Sam minus- Howell move a year ago, you know, with Rattler. Right. You know, could be. Yeah. B minus class for me. Uh, I like Fuaga and I really love the Kool Aid McKinstry pick. Might have been my favorite pick in this entire division, but, you know, no second or, you know, uh, no third or fourth round picks. And, you know, right. some guys because of past dealings. So that, that knocks him down a little bit. Um, two starters, though. So solid draft for the, the solid, new one. Yeah. Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Graham Barton is how they led this thing off with the 26th selection in round one Duke center. And he will play center for them. That, that was one of the big thing, you know, Fuaga, what's he going to play? Oh, well, all right. They're going to give him a shot at left tackle. Don't love the fit. I do love the fit here, even though it's a less valuable position in Graham Barton moving from college left tackle to how many of these offensive linemen in the first round are changing positions, by the way, the left know, tackles are going in or to the right, the right tackles are going to the left. The I mean, even the, alt switching. You know, I mean, like the first one taken. And the second one taken, Latham's going to the left side. You know, like, crazy. Foster New? Is he the only one that's playing the same position he played in college? In the first round? Uh, he's going to go to the right. 
Oh, is he? Yeah, almost certain. Yeah, I've not seen that 100%, but I think he is going to the right. Yeah. They all moved. They all moved. Every single yeah. one. That's, that's, is that's it everyone? Uh, that's, I yeah, think so. That's, I, I can't I think, think you're right. Uh, Mims, I think I saw he's going to try to play on the left side, right? That's that's where they're putting him? I didn't see any news on that. How about Packers, uh, Arizona guy? Um, oh, yep. Nope. They, he's going to stay at tackle, left tackle. There you okay. go. Okay. Okay. So the one guy I thought for sure would move into guard. He's actually <laughs> right. The one that should tackle. move. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Anyway, uh, back to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Grand I think Guyton is switching sides too. Now I think about it. All right. Yep. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love Grant Barton. I love his, I think he's the center's the right spot for him. I think it's the best spot for him. Uh, I, I think, you know, Jackson powers, Johnson, there were some injury concerns. Some other things with him is why he fell. So we'll, we'll see if Grant Barton is actually the best center in this class, but love the way he plays smart, tough, uh, it's, it's fun tape to watch for Graham Barton. So, you know, solid, he's a center. So, you, you know, you're not going to do backflips for taking a center at the end of round one, but it was the end of round one. It wasn't the beginning of round one or anything like mm-hmm. that. At so solid selection. Uh, I'm just not super jazzed about the rest of this class. Chris Braswell, Alabama edge rusher in round two. You got Tyke Smith, Georgia safety in round three, came back at the end of round three with Jalen McMillan, Washington wide receiver, Bucky Irving running back out of Oregon in round four. In round six, Elijah Klein, uh, Texas El Paso guard, and then Devin Culp, tight end out of Washington in round seven. A couple, man, so many Washington players in this draft class. Two more here. Uh, Jalen McMillan, round three, might be my favorite. That's my favorite. Pick. Yeah. Yeah, solid selection there. I think he's a player that's going to contribute for you, but that's kind of what they did on day two. Braswell Smith, McMillan, contributors. Are they starters? The high level players, they're they're solid players. We'll see what happens there. Then you get a center in round one. So no marquee draft picks for me here, but I think solid and you know a depth draft. And maybe you get yourself a you know an all pro type of center in Graham Barton. We'll see how he turns out there. Player I like a lot, but you know, this class doesn't really get me super jazzed either. And the thing is, he kind of has to be an all pro to make it worth it. You know, I mean, if you're using a first round interior lineman, they kind of have to be. Quentin Nelson, you know, uh, one of the pouncy, you know, like you better be a pretty uh, high end player at your position. So I stole this from Mike Sando and then I double checked it. And of course it was correct. I mean, he knows he's on top of things. So if we define the NFL premium positions and if you, I'm talking purely finances and what the league spends, yep. you're not going to be able to have any argument with this quarterback, wide receiver, tackle, defensive tackle, Edge, corner. I know that's six positions and that eats up a lot. So maybe premium isn't the right word. And that leaves safety, linebacker, running back, center, guard, tight end as quote non premium positions. So, okay, hang with me for a second. Those six premium positions, the first 43 picks in this draft, 41 of them were premium positions. The only other one was Brock Bowers, other than Graham Barton. You know, like, Maybe we should do a segment Wednesday when we do mailbag about the league understands finances. You know what I mean? Like 41 of 43 of the first picks in the draft were premium positions. And that doesn't mean this is a bad pick or Bowers is a bad pick, but you're zigging when the rest of the league is zagging financially. You know, I've struggled with this too, because the 49ers have been a team that has zagged and Mm -hmm. they are really strong at those positions you mentioned they're they're strong at they just drafted another couple of guards they they're strong at running back linebacker tight end and 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 so and they've got a lot of money wrapped up in those positions and then they bypass tackle again in this class is what everyone thought they were going to take and uh you know they do have an expensive tackle and expensive edge as well they're cheap at quarterback so they're kind of built backwards yeah yeah you can also I think it's easier to get really good at those positions because of that too. So you better it, not miss. You know what I mean? Well, you don't want to miss if you are spending on it, right? So if it's a if it's a high draft pick or if it's a big money contract, you can't miss. But you can also, I think it's a it's a, it is a way to build a powerhouse at those positions. It's it can be done easier. And maybe it's so difficult that the the positions to the the premier positions are more difficult to find difference making players. Maybe there's more bad money spent there, so maybe there is some. Man, 
and it gets really convoluted, but maybe there's some secret genius to saying, well, we're just going to be great at the positions it's easy to be great at, and everyone else is going to be mediocre there, so we're going to win there, and it's too hard yeah. to be consistently great at the expensive positions, so maybe we'll bypass that and not fight everybody for the same same wedge of cheese. Maybe we should postpone this to Wednesday because <laughs> you know it's better than me, but like if Lance would have hit, they wouldn't be built that way. You know, Sometimes it's just the cards that were dealt you you know, be in a good organization and McCaffrey became available. Warner turned into a stud. Okay, great. You know, well, it doesn't mean we're going to turn our back on non-premium positions. And frankly, my team, if, if Fahu Tanu wasn't there at 20, I can almost guarantee our listeners that Barton would have been the pick for the Steelers. You know, they Ooh. loved them and he was next up. Yeah. Um, I mean, and I don't think it's a bad pick, nor is the Bowers one. But 41 out of 43 was overwhelming to me in this draft. And then, but then you, uh, the, what I what I always end up coming back to is a perfect example of what you're talking about with the Steelers too. It it I always come back to okay, well you don't get the tackle. Well, guess what? There's centers in round two. There's centers yeah, in round yeah. four, and so that's why it's easier to build those positions because there's more of them available. They're yeah. easier to find. They're cheaper for you. So you've There'll got be some to, next year too. There right. might not be tackles next. You got to you know. find a path to finding your quarterback, your tackle, even if it's un, you know, even if it's a. Uh, unconventional path maybe you need more time to develop maybe you, you draft a player who's more of a project you have to take some chances to find those positions or you'll never have them because there's too many people fighting for them and drafting them early and paying them yeah. more money. and you don't want to go shopping for those positions in free agency like if you need a tackle and you have to get one in free agency you're going to lose that battle all day long you're going to pay for a player who's a tier better than what the player you're actually getting is or a couple of in some cases so I know we're up against it. I give the Bucks a C plus. It's not because Barton's not a premium position. I just see a lot of contributors, not difference makers. I think those are the words you said. McMillan, to me, um, really is my favorite pick because Evans is up in age. Godwin's a free agent after the year, and he would be a, and he's a quality three for right now. So um, again, I just don't see. I don't think Braswell's ever going to be a star. I, I think Tyke Smith's an okay slot nickel whatever third yeah. safety you know if one of those players really surprises and is more than a you know a, a rotational kind of good backup or kind mm -hmm. of a dirty starter player on day two then you know that the the great will jump because even if i like mcmillan you know i don't think he was like a phenomenal value still a third no. round pick for a guy who's you know maybe going to be a number two number three at most in his career um you know it's all about graham barton in this class and i like graham barton it's probably safe money but again uh He's a center, so I had, I had the same grade, C-plus, for the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Mm -hmm. So the Saints were my favorite draft uh, in probably the worst drafted division of the eight, and they were probably the worst division of the eight to start with. So they got yeah. the least help, and they did the worst job. And <laughs> the you opportunity know. to try to gain, and nobody gained on anybody there. Not so really. More mediocrity, I think, this year in the, in the NFC South, but it'll be fun to watch, yeah. D, C, B minus, C plus. Those are my four grades for the South. Mine were pretty close. I don't remember exactly, but yeah. Next up, AFC South, and then the last two divisions in the West, NFC and AFC West draft grades coming up this week. And also, as Matt mentioned a little bit earlier, get those mailbag questions in yep. for Wednesday. We've got scheduled release as well. So actually, we're probably going to go Wednesday night, yeah. finishing up these draft grades. So we'll, we'll cover the the schedule on Thursday. Get those questions in at BD Peacock at Williamson NFL on Twitter or drop a question in the YouTube comments. Subscribe while you're there. Matt and I back tomorrow. Peacock and Williamson.